Yeah. Um, so my name is Ketaji Claiborne. I use she, her, and they, them pronouns. I am a licensed clinical social worker um, and staff therapist at Integrative Empowerment Group um, in Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor, Michigan. I, I am, identify as a Black, queer, trans, non-binary femme um, who is committed to supporting Black um, LGBTQ folks in healing, self-growth, self-love, and liberation. That's really where I'm coming from. That's brought me to social work, and that is um, what's keeping, like, that's the blood in my body right now. Um, it has been for some time, just really making sure that Black LGBTQ folks have space to heal and process and um, create the lives that they want to live in the face of white supremacy. Great. So um, in one or two sentences, uh, could you describe what the MFP means to you? Uh, you know, MFP for me was such a great space and opportunity to meet other Black, Indigenous, and um, social workers of color. Like, from, that was just great. Like, it was great to really meet folks who were also committed to this work within our own respective communities. Um, and learn from each other. It was the first time that I really had that space um, to really do that work. Great. Uh, you've worked with LGBTQ populations in multiple settings. What are some uh, common themes that you've found in your practice? So having worked in uh, youth centers, medical centers, university-based LGBTQ, centers and community mental health spaces, I've seen a lot of folks having to navigate, you know, depression, anxiety, stress management, um, identity exploration, and identity, identity development, you know, exploration of spirituality and how they want to heal, um, and some bringing in some of their own um, healing perspectives from their own cultural backgrounds, um, navigating and healing from trauma that is, you know, violence-based or abuse and or systematic oppression that is experienced. Um, suicidal ideation and self-harm, uh, development of self-esteem, self-compassion, and personal power um, as folks who are having to navigate um, within systems um, of oppression that often want to silence, um, create violence, and discriminate against us. Yeah. Right. So how do individuals from minoritized racial ethnic backgrounds experience uh, the issues you were just describing? Yeah, the the issues for me were just when I, when working with folks, I've noticed that they're just much more intensified and much more layered when you add the component of being a black person and a, an indigenous person um, and or someone who is a person of color. Right. Like when you add being LGBTQ and also being identifying as BIPOC or within a BIPOC community, um, there's aspects of having to navigate intersectional identity um, exploration and development, um, having to, you know, really work through, you know, um, cultural and political issues that are really um, uh, salient to your specific identity and or salient to other identities of folks and communities that you care about. Um, really working with folks who are on the front lines of liberation and trying to address and organize around systematic oppression and violence that Black, Indigenous, and communities of color often experience. And also just, you know, developing a critical consciousness about themselves and the work they want to be doing within community. So there's... Uh, I, I, in the way you're talking, I hear both the healing clinical therapeutic piece, and also a social advocacy piece. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that is how um, I see my work. I see my work as being someone who is, help, who is here to support healing and also advocate for and with. And oftentimes when it comes to working with LGBTQ folks who have intersecting marginalized identities, um, it's not just, you know, how do I heal from you know, X, Y, Z. It's actually, how do I heal from this and how do I address it? You know, 
Um, because often the trauma is not just trauma that is experienced by them. It's trauma that may be experienced because of where they live at or the skin of their skin tone, right? Or, you know, their, you know, their background. And those are things that can be inherited when we live in a system um, built on, you know, white supremacy and um, the enslavement of others, the genocide of indigenous folks and stealing of land. And so, um, I'm, I am a social worker that believes in the importance of bringing in our histories when it comes to doing this kind of healing work um, and creating space for folks to think about how can they regain agency and power in order to, you know, live the life they want to live. And a lot of times that also includes organizing and activism and social advocacy because they've had to learn how to advocate for themselves. Um, so I'm going to transition just a, a, a little bit. Um, and so why is the care clinic so important for the LGBTQ community? You know, I really, I've worked at a, I've worked um, in a queer clinic, an LGBTQ um, clinic for the last four years. And it is so important because LGBTQ folks are still experiencing violence, silencing, discrimination, and oppression everywhere, right? And so that also specifically looks like in our healthcare, you know, are there um, competent providers that can actually address our needs in a way that is not based on the heterosexes, like very standard way of, you know, working with us, right? And so a queer clinic is so important because it provides a space for folks to work with providers that may look like them, providers that may have similar and or shared experiences, and also providers who are like passionate about this work and also competent and knowledgeable about this work. Um, and so for me, most specifically, these clinics have to be centering um, the needs of LGBTQ folks who are most marginalized. That looks like working with folks who identify as Black, Indigenous, and or folks of color. That looks like working with folks who are low income and or underemployed, um, transgender and non-binary folks, um, people who are experiencing homelessness and or housing instability, people with disabilities. Um, and people who may or may not, who, who may be undocumented, right? What does it mean for us to really be a space that meets the holistic needs, um, that, that really gets to the needs of our diverse community? Great. Um, so last question. is: uh, What are one or two things that social workers need to do to develop and maintain a culturally competent practice with minoritized LGBTQ individuals. Mm -hmm. It's important to me as social workers that we remember our commitment to social justice. Um, for me, a practice with LGBTQ individuals and communities um, that is culturally competent really, really um, requires us to um, acknowledge and address our own internalized homophobia, transphobia, white supremacy, anti-blackness, classism, sexism, um, ableism, and fat phobia. Because, you know, we are the people that are going into these rooms and supporting folks and, you know, creating these policies and doing all of this work. And if we haven't really dug into our own internalized isms, they will then come out in our care. They will then come out in our policies. They will then come out in our practices. And what does it mean for us? You know, that, that commitment to social justice means something. And it means that we're willing to do the work to ensure that our systems are equitable and that they are built on justice and they are built on healing. And so that really requires you as a social worker to, be in, to really be interrogating um, your own internalized um, oppression. You know, what are systems in our organizations that further stigmatize silence, discriminate, bring violence against LGBTQ communities, and those who are specifically at the margins of intersecting identities. Um, I just really believe the work starts with us acknowledging and working against our own internalized systems of oppression um, 
and being really cognizant about how that work um, is then carried out with our the people that we care about, people that we're working with, and organizations that we're working with.